great to have you here. Welcome to the podcast. With me and my guests from around the world. Welcome to the Simon Filer podcast. Welcome to this podcast. Let's get into it, shall we? On the Simon Filer podcast. Hello there. Marnie Perna is a natural therapist whose specialty is stress management. She's a qualified kinesiologist and owner of Kine Consultancy in Brisbane, Australia. She is also an international author and speaker. Marnie recorded her audiobook Creating Calm Amid Chaos here at Brisbane Audiobook Production three years ago already, July 2017. Time flies when you're having fun. And I can qualify that Marnie is the stress management queen. Welcome, Marnie Panna. Thank you very much. It's a, a, an awesome title to have. Stress man I call myself a stress buster, so stress management queen sounds a lot better. <laughs> and that you are, though. You've been doing it for a long time. Let's start off with where your stress management journey began, Marnie. Okay, well, I was a stay-at-home mum. And um, just at the end of my children's high school years, I realised I had a bit of spare time. Now, I, I left a job, not a profession, so I wasn't looking to go back into a, a job again. Mm -hmm. But um, my elderly mum and my husband both developed a health challenge and mainstream medicine couldn't help. So it made us look outside the square. Now, I was a traditional person. I had a little box. I lived in that. If I, we were sick, we went to the doctor. We got well or we didn't. But when my elderly mum, especially, she had Ross River without it being diagnosed, she was just told she was old, fat and lazy, oh, basically. Dear. So you kind of had to look elsewhere. Yeah. And, That's um, not we, a very nice um, result from the doctor. No, so. they didn't quite come out fully and say that, no. but that was the impression. If only she was less lazy, she would get out of bed. If she lost weight, she'd feel better, basically. And if she wasn't as old, and she was only in her 70s. Okay. So she wasn't old, old, and she'd looked after a five-acre allotment. So it wasn't that she couldn't look after herself. So where did you go to next? What happened then? Well, then I took mum to a naturopath and a kinesiologist and a homeopath. And they would listen and they said, yes, all those symptoms made sense. Whereas medicals would say, oh, that doesn't, that doesn't mean anything. So I went, oh, that's interesting. Mm. And then my husband developed a bulging disc in his spine. Right. And again, I thought, oh, I'll try the weird guy. So we went back to, <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's what it seemed like at the time. Yeah, I guess so, if you're used to just traditional. Yeah, mm. so we went to the kinesiologist again and um, in time it helped. But as a person standing back looking, watching a kinesiologist at work, it just looked crazy. I, I honestly thought the guy needed to go to the toilet the first time I watched him work because he was jigging around and everything. I thought, oh, please, mate, we've got time. Just go. Wow. I know. All right. So did you ask him questions? How did it come about then? Well, well I, firstly, did it help? It helped, yes. And then he, he had long-term um, chiropractic work as well. But it made me realise that the questions he was asking and the response he was getting from my husband on a, on a physical level was making sense. If people know kinesiology, it's using muscle testing and, and the muscle works. When there's a stress trigger mentioned, the muscle doesn't work as well. And as a lay person, you can see this happening. Mm -hmm. So it sort of tweaked my interest and I thought, well, that's interesting. I don't mind that. So then we made a, a weekly appointment Okay. and someone in the family would need it. And then eventually the penny says, okay, well, how about you go and learn it and then you can help your family. So I, I did a weekend course. My husband reckoned it turned into a monster because it just <laughs> envelops your life. It's then. still going. <laughs> it's still going, yes. Yeah. So did you go back to that same doctor and ask him how to get into kinesiology? Or? I did. I trained through the guy that, that we'd found that All a friend right. had recommended. And did you so, have a dig at him about how he looked like he needed to go he, to the He toilet? laughed. I've, I've often told it to him. And I was still mainstream at that stage, so I didn't think kinesiology was... Um, woo wooey. I thought it was because this guy's very structurally based right. and I thought it's all structural. There's no, you know, arty farty or woo woo stuff into it. Yeah. So also my background was we had a niece and she'd gone, she was a nurse and she'd gone to Ireland to work and got involved in a cult over oh, there. Oh wow. Now the cult she got involved with was a Reiki cult, which I had never heard of That's either. That's not too bad then. <laughs> no. Well, I hadn't heard of Reiki. I hadn't heard of kinesiology, so it didn't cult. make any difference. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I had all sorts of things in yeah. here crop up then in my mind. <laughs> yeah. But uh, this particular, I mean, Reiki is just a very normal natural therapy. Yeah. But in this group that she got involved with was a bit weird and she ended up taking her own life. <gasps> so for oh, me, that I'm was so like sorry. a danger or a stress trigger, the word Reiki. Right. And day one of kinesiology, everyone has to introduce themselves and I was surrounded by people who did Reiki and wow. I was so scared. I just said, oh my God, I'm gonna die. <laughs> oh dear. 
So do you think that Carl, as you called it, had anything to do with her taking her life? Yes. Yeah. The police couldn't prove it, but it was considered assisted suicide. Okay. It was just the wrong group. So Reiki really, it just happened to be called, they were learning some Reiki, but it was an actual cult that she managed okay. to find. Right. Well, um, over here, Reiki is, is one of the natural healing modalities and it has beautiful results. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Mm. So when you said that, I thought it wasn't a cult. So no. that's really But you can disturbing. imagine not knowing that word and hearing yeah, it in relation definitely. to your niece's passing and then suddenly everyone it's you know is one of them. <laughs> in the new course you're just about to do, you can imagine. So, yeah. so it took me a little bit to adapt to the, what I call the metaphysical side of natural therapies. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I struggled for a tad. Yeah. But then eventually you sort of go, this is awesome. Yeah. And how long was your initial course? We did two and a half years of training to get our diploma and then we, you never stop because you're always doing additional yeah, courses and course. keeping your um, professional developer and up. <laughs> Was that your phone? Yeah. <laughs> I put it there so it wouldn't buzz. <laughs> That's always the way. So how long ago was that? Um, I graduated in 2006. So remember too, back then, Google wasn't used very often by everyone. You couldn't Google yes. kinesiology, you couldn't Google Reiki, you couldn't Google most things. Yeah. Right? Because most people didn't have a home computer. Uh, and if you did, you were limited in what you did with it. I, I reckon we've come leaps and bounds since then, and people can actually get onto the internet. And if they want to go and see a kinesiologist, they can put in the word kinesiologist in their area and yeah. then find people yeah. that show up. So my my background with kinesiology, apart from yourself and, and going through your audio book when we did that, is it just basically squeezing the muscle in between your thumb and forefinger? Because as far as I'm aware, that's what kinesiology is. <laughs> I haven't done that one. <laughs> to try oh, it's not even that <laughs> no it's one of the natural therapy modalities yeah. all right so it has its basis in chinese philosophy right and the chinese health system work on the triad of health so that all sides of your triangle of life have to be in harmony for you to function well kinesiologists use muscle testing so maybe the squeezing in between your thumb and finger is one of those you just find a muscle that works with integrity it just means it knows its job and when the muscle knows its job and then you make a statement that causes a stress, the muscle gives a momentarily let go. Okay. Okay, so it doesn't hold as firmly as it was. Right. Also, as far as I'm aware with kinesiology, it points to certain ailments, I guess. Mm. So is it exactly to do with the muscle that you're squeezing or that muscle? No. No, no, no the, muscle you, <laughs> the muscle you start working with is just what you call an indicator muscle. So right. it's kind of like your, your mouse. It's the mouse looking for things on the computer. Okay. Your computer's your brain. Right. So... So that was 2006. Yep. And so now obviously you have your thriving business in Brisbane at Ganeke. How did you get into that? Well, what they don't tell you when you start to do natural therapies generally is that you won't get hired by anyone. Okay. That's so a good start. You, so you have to um, own your own business. Okay. So you either consult for someone else or you open your own clinic. Right. And that's a learning curve on its own. Yes, it is. Yeah. I totally agree. So how long were you with the chap that taught you? Well, we trained through him and I still go back there for um, upgraded um, lessons and things like that. But you go out on your own. So you start your own business. So I started Kinique virtually straight away. Right. And so what about your husband and mum obviously were behind you because you'd had results yeah. with that? Well, um, mum and dad were my guinea pigs. Okay. So whenever I <laughs> learnt a new um, method, I'd say, hey, I need help. <laughs> And obviously, well, they were quick to say yes. Oh, yeah, they loved it. it. Mum especially. Yeah. Dad, Dad's German. He was right. a little bit um, not harder to convince, but you had to ask Dad a different way. Okay. With Dad, it would be more, I'm learning a new method. Could you let me use you and then you feed back to me? And then he'd give me his opinion. Right. But, yeah. And what about, because you've got a family as well, your children, what did they think? You know what? I started to work on family. The ones you don't work on are your family. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> To you sell. pass them on to other people. <laughs> so, I mean, you help them sometimes, but overall, I find other people to help them. Mm. Yeah. And you've branched out. I mean, you do other things besides um, kinesiology now. I saw on your website you do angel card reading. Yeah. And yeah. So, has, how's that progressed? How's that come? It's all part of what I call the metaphysical basket or tool basket that I use. And, and again, I, I really struggled about angel reading and, and things like that. But I also realised with my background, I was a Catholic and uh, I am brought up as a Catholic. So we always had angels in our life. I just hadn't thought of them in the same way. Mm. So we always spoke to our angels. It's We're so very different. similar. My dad's German and I was brought up a Catholic yeah. as well. So, and I definitely hear where yeah. you're coming from. With so angels. we always had our guardian angels. We always had, and my aunt was a Good Samaritan nun. Right. And um, one of her ladies or the, one of the people she worked, um, lived with 
was Sister John, and Sister John had a St. Joseph's basket. Okay. And if anyone got sick or lost anything, you'd ring up Sister John and she'd put it in the St. Joseph basket and it would miraculously appear or something would happen. And I still use that. That's amazing. So, and, and she's quite happy for everyone to use her. So, you know, if you've lost something, call on Sister John. Excellent. Right. I'll have to remember that one. Yeah. So 14 years on, beginning yeah. your business, what kind of process did you go through? How did you recruit clients? A lot of it's word of mouth. Yeah. Because people are starting to understand kinesiology, but it's not the first thing that people start looking for. Yeah. So like any business owner, you join networking groups, you join business associations, you become accredited. Yeah. So um, for many years we had health fund status. Yeah. So that gave, gave us a little bit of credibility. It just moved on from there. So, And as a business owner, you've got to be able to adapt and morph as well. So. Yeah. So back in the day, you wouldn't have had your own website or anything like that? I had a very basic um, website that I built and it was very clunky. Okay. <laughs> As they all were probably Yeah, but again, it was that credibility if you didn't have a website. And um, Facebook hadn't really kicked off by that stage. Um, so it wasn't as used as it is by businesses. Did you do letter dropping or anything like that? or um, I, You'd hear something like someone would approach you and say, hey, would you like to advertise on here or somewhere else? So I did the, the um, TV advertising. I did the back of the, the little leaflets that you get at the chemist. Because yeah. they all seemed like great ideas at yeah, the time. Of course. But in the end, I think it's your own word of mouth that yeah. you get out there because the tele the picture one was in a gym and no one used kinesiology. And that's the other thing. You'd go and visit things like gyms and, and different places and let them know that you were working or do um, little talks. That yeah. was another thing. I, I did a lot of library talks. Yeah, and I think that it's also your reputation precedes you. So if you have your clients tell other people, that's also... Yeah, word of mouth is your number one yeah. source of new clients. Yeah. You did your audio book with me. I did. Uh, and that was a wonderful experience. I really enjoyed working with you. When, how did that come about? How did you decide I'm going to write a book now? I wrote the book initially because I was trying to explain to clients what stress does to them because clients come to see me when their stress is really high and their life energy or their potential to cope is really low. And uh, you'd say to them, oh, you're really stressed. And they'd sit there and they'd go, no, no, I'm not stressed at all. And you go, hmm, really? Because <laughs> for you looking on, they, they're quite stressed in certain aspects of their life. So I needed to be able to say, well, this is what stress does to you. This is how your body responds to it. So yes, you are stressed. Mm. But I couldn't find a lay book. Like you could get technical ones, but I couldn't find anything that related to a client or a client would relate to in their language. So I um, thought of an analogy and the analogy was the stress bucket. So if you imagine you had the line through the middle of your body. Stress... I remember thinking at the time, <laughs> my stress level is overflowing. Yes, yes. <laughs> oh, and now you've just said you can see that. I hope you didn't see yeah, that. No, not at the time. <laughs> you were awesome. You were so calming for someone recording their, their book. And I love the way you could listen to what I was saying and still say, no, no, you got that wrong. Because I'd be so busy listening that I'd forget to say something. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, sometimes it's really tricky. Yeah. Oh, you were awesome. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Um, so when your clients come in, like, can you see auras or anything? No, nah. well, I or... don't know, no. So they start, start talking and then you can, how can you tell that they're stressed? They're there. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, they're they've arrived. <laughs> Look, people um, get to a certain level and they realise they need help. Yeah. They're not sure. They're more and more nowadays understanding what kinesiology is and how it can help or natural therapies. So to me, a perfect world would be natural therapies and mainstream medicine work in collaboration with each yeah. other and each support each other, not this, you go to them or these and not in the middle. Yeah, right. To me, it's about um, collaborating and, and using all of our resources. So do you think people are using it more? I think people have more access to information so that they're looking for alternatives to their health. I think people are feeling more empowered and that empowerment comes through choice. Mm. So they can choose what they want to use and, and what they don't want to use. People coming to you, I mean, obviously, if you're going to find out that they're stressed and they're there because they are stressed, what kind of conversation do you have with them? Not that I want to know exactly what, but obviously you're a bit of a counsellor maybe that you... It's sort of like counselling, but it's more about emotional um, support. The questions I ask them are specific about them as an individual. Then when we get on to why are they here, that was one of the questions I asked them. Why are you here? So they might say, oh, I can't play golf on weekends or I, my stomach doesn't work as well. I get bloated very easy. So can you test up foods or whatever? Right. And so depending on what there uh, is happening in their life, I then ask things, what makes it worse? What makes it better? Yeah. Have you seen someone else? 
Um, what does your doctor say? Have you seen really good results in people that walk away yeah, and you fix yeah. them? You don't always know because some people come once and you don't see them again. You go, oh, okay, well, obviously it didn't work. <laughs> and then years later, you'll randomly get this call and this person will say, oh, look, I saw you once for this and it worked so well and I've been really great, but now I need help. And you go, wow. That's amazing. So you don't always know, all right? And and with emotional work, which is, I'd say, 80% of what I do, Yeah. It's personal as well. So it's not something they're going to go and shout out to the rooftops no, over. So you don't have a lot of that on your website with yeah. testimonials and things like that. Yeah. But with an emotional work, it's more about are they coping better? So if they realize they're coping better, well, then they realize that life's a little bit easier. Mm. And how does it affect you? How do you deal with all that stress, all your stress and their stress? <laughs> I don't take it on board. Right. You, you it's like... Um, I know when I spoke to you about the audio book and I said you could listen and, and understand what you were doing and hear what was going on. Yeah. I'm the same. I can hear what's going on in their life. I can help them or assist them or facilitate their healing. Mm -hmm. And it's not even about healing them. It's their responsibility, not mine. So how would you, for the people listening, you know, if they're feeling like really depressed, really stressed, like you don't get down to that point where you feel like you're suicidal. I mean, that's a medical emergency. Yeah. yeah. Um, that kind of leads me to COVID because I heard that the suicide rate actually went up mm. through COVID. How did, how did you deal with COVID and, and were those clients still able to come in and see you? Okay, or? well, like many businesses, I was highly affected by the restrictions in COVID. So my business is home-based, a bit like yours here. Yeah. So And mine is not separate from the house. So they actually walk in through the front door and go through the kitchen and up the hallway and into the, right. into the clinic. So I had to shut shop straight away. Yeah. We weren't allowed to have people come on site. So I spent about, I think, the first six weeks converting my business to online. And that, that included, there was a lot of business things like admin stuff that had to happen, like a booking. So you had to find a booking um, program right. and then work out if you could work it out. So you're talking about your website? Yeah, putting it onto your website and then engaging your website developer to put it onto your website and she did the COVID statement. And, yeah. you know, so that took probably six six plus weeks to do yeah. that and a lot of decision making so you had to sit there and go okay can I manage this because I'm not the biggest technical person yeah. in the world I'd love to be but I'm not <laughs> so it had to be something that I could manage as well because um, I don't have a receptionist or anything like that so yeah. so yeah did you go into a bit of a panic when you thought oh, I've got a it's all going to close down or nah. It, nah. <laughs> oh, that's right you're the stress management queen. I, yeah I am but also too like um, I have a husband who's, who's still employed so it doesn't um, kinesiology for me has always been about adding to the family income, not being the whole family income. So yeah. I've been very blessed yeah. in my life in that respect. I saw on your website too that you're doing online consultancy. Yeah. How are you finding that? Love it. Yeah. I think it's great. Yeah. Is it just as easy as them coming It is. And I had like the clients that I've seen, none of them have been new clients. I don't think I had, oh, one, one lady was brand new, but all the others were clients that I had been seeing that were not sure how the online kinesiology would work. Yeah. But afterwards went, wow, that was awesome. They can so do it from the comfort of their own They can, home. and the safety of the home and, and through technology. Yeah. And one lady even did it through FaceTime because she was a bit older and couldn't work out how to download Zoom. Okay. So we just did FaceTime. It was oh, perfect. Easy. Yeah. yeah, that's very cool. What happens then with when you need to have your hands on? Well, we do something called surrogacy. So we get permission from the person to tap into their energy field really right. it, look it sounds woo woo but it's not it's really quite um, practical it's it, there's a protocol in place mm -hmm. and we get permission and do it that way and then one of the other things i set up was a um, curious system so if they needed because i often use drops or remedies within the clinic that the client gets as home reinforcement okay so um one of the things i put in place was a courier who i could ring up and say hey i've got something to get delivered can you pick it up and deliver it to the client so they were still getting their service they were still getting um products from me if they needed it yeah but they were getting that support so what kind of product essences herbals? so rescue remedy herbals um mm. anything doesn't yeah. matter so my i make a range of um healing mists so sometimes they need the healing mist sometimes it's essential oil so i might send it to them in a little locket yeah but i was also able then to provide them with the um like i do up like a client note yeah. and send that with them as well so that they could look at like when they're in the room it's a little bit different so this was a different experience for them so i had to support them in what was going on so my support was to write it up for them and they had the piece of paper then mm. it sounds really interesting do you love i love you it. Do yeah, it yeah yeah i do so yep. it was probably in hindsight a really good thing that look it's something a lot of <laughs> kinesiologists were wanting to do so you could imagine you're located in brisbane and if i had a client like one client used to fly over to visit her daughter from perth 
and she would come and see me when she was in Brisbane, but it a bit hard to get a call back yeah. all the time yeah. from Perth. Yeah. So if you're dealing with clients that are not local, um, it's a lot easier for yeah, them. Yeah, online is perfect. Yeah. So it's probably, in hindsight, COVID's been a good thing for you. Well, well kind of. Yeah, well, the associations were, they weren't as comfortable as people doing online, but no. they had to convert as well. And we've done like webinars, you, you, professional development has all been done online. Mm. We've been networking online. You know, I'm a volunteer. We've been doing our volunteer meetings online. So people have, have adapted to not seeing people. Yeah. It is, it's different though, isn't yeah. it? No hugs. It, yeah, no hugs. <laughs> and it's also the, the gesture, the person, you yeah. know, like the hand gestures and whatnot. Yeah, like me standing here. Yeah. yeah. I'm doing lots of deco <laughs> the hand movements here. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to go back to your book. How's everything going with it? Um, and your audio book as well, Creating Calm Amid Chaos. It's been out for a few years now. Yep. Have you got any tips on now that you've got some hindsight for uh, potential authors that want to do publish their book and what would I, be good and what wouldn't be good? I'm on my third reprint, which for me is just awesome because awesome. it's all been um, like no big publishing firm generally you takes on. Didn't I self published, you? Yeah. yeah, and I print it locally, so it's printed in Brisbane, and the audio obviously was done locally. Yeah. The audio for me was great because it was in my voice. People listening to it hear me in their ears. That's a really good thing. I you know, specialise in people that still come today. I always try and steer mm -hmm. them that way that they do it themselves, particularly self-help books and books like yours. I think the thing you don't know when you do it the first time is you don't know how energetic to make your voice. Yeah. <laughs> so you sort of hope that how you've said it has been comfortable for people. Yeah. But I mean, I've had some good feedback and... For me doing audio, it was all about being able to, um, for people to access it who couldn't read or write. Yeah. So it was a, a tool for people who couldn't sit and read a book physically. Yeah, yeah. So, um, blind they, people. Blind well. people, yeah. but a lot of learning difficulties as well. Yeah. Because that's what made me consider it because I had a, a lady who I was working with who said it'd be great to have as an audio for people who couldn't sit down and read mm, a book. Yeah, so valuable. That's good. Yeah. I'm so glad that it's out there and yeah, that people are finding value in it. Will you be writing any others? Look, there's a couple on the on the on the burn. Um, a couple of them are children's books because right. they've got little granddaughters now, and one of them loves ducks, and you can't find duck stories anywhere. <laughs> Believe it or not, you can't, except the ugly duckling, which makes her cry. So I've written a little story about her as a duck oh. and her sister in it, and then the other another granddaughter loves penguins. So I sort of sit there and pen little, and that started from a. Um, I wrote the duck story in response to a writers club. You had to have a limited number. You had to include these words in, this, in right. the story. You just, like a contest type of Like thing. a contest yeah. and you'd submitted that and, and if you won, you won $1,000. Well, I didn't win, but I got the story. Yeah. So the story was written. So All I've got to do is, yeah, so I've just <laughs> got to get the illustrator and I'll do that. Um, it's a bit expensive as a, you know, a gift to my daughter, yeah. granddaughter, local artists, but you know, there's places you can get them. Yeah, there's a lot of a lot of um, help here in Brisbane, yeah. like within the publishing industry. I'm part of Bang. I don't know. You're part of I'm Bang. I'm part of Bang, yeah. That's the yeah. Brisbane Networking Group. Yeah, there's a lot of like-minded people. And through that network, you can find illustrators, editors, yeah. publishers, and all sorts. So It's amazing how many editors you have in your sphere of influence once you've written a book. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> once it's out. Once it's out. Oh, did you see that uh, you know thing on line three of page 21? <laughs> no. In fact... There is one thing in the book that I must have to get addressed um, and it's apparently on one of the sections I've spoken about, I think I spoke about Thomas Edison being the light, he is the light bulb man, isn't he? Yeah. But I've called it Graham Bell. Oh, right. And someone was critiquing. He's a telephone. He's, yeah, he yeah. was a telephone yeah. man and no one picked it up. I think I had five oh, editors right. and we didn't pick it up when I was doing it here either. Oh, wow. And someone on um, was doing a an Amazon response on my book. And her response to me was, how can I take that seriously when you can't even get your information right? And I went, what? Oh, no. <laughs> In the whole book. That's always the way, yeah, though, isn't it? Yeah. Is gonna hate. <laughs> I know. Yeah. And you have to let it go. But then I went, really? Yeah. So I went looking and you think I could find it even initially. Oh, no. So, yeah. So little things like that. Yeah. But, you know, people forgive you most of the time. Yeah, exactly. I've said to a lot of my authors that the published, self-published authors, there's only 2% that ever make it. So, mm. I mean, that is tiny. So congratulations. Yeah. But the, the thrill you get. Like I um, recently did a, a webinar with a group of kinesiologists that I put together and one of the people that listened to the webinar got back to me after the webinar and said, you won't know me, but I attended one of your library talks and I won the book on the day and I had written in it. I usually write a little note to whoever wins it 
and uh, she said, you thought I was amazing. She said, you've got no idea what that, how that changed my life. Wow. That an author thought I was amazing. Oh, isn't that lovely? And so, so you don't know the effect you're having on people yeah. or what you do has on other people's lives. Well, I had a chap in here recently, Adam Bocart, and he was talking about authors. And really, it's a short word for authoritarian on your subject. Yeah. So, I mean, once you've written a book like that, it takes... Well, obviously, years to get to a point where you know your craft that well to be able to write a book on it. So you are an authoritarian on it, and but to get feedback like that must be. It is because you you tend to mix with similar kind of people. So a lot of yeah. people I knew and and networked with and and worked with professionally had written a book. So I remember when mine was being published, I thought, yeah, it's no big deal. It's just a book, you know. <laughs> yeah. And and you had that kind of mindset because you thought, well, everyone else has done it as well. I'm I'm not something unusual or special yeah. and um, it's not until someone buys your book or hears that you're an author and goes oh my goodness you're an author that is amazing you know and you go oh it is actually yeah it is it really is so you need to own it so for new authors really be proud of your achievements because it's huge yeah so, absolutely huge well I think it's an absolutely amazing task I've been doing my audio books for four years and a bit and couple of you have all said to me you're going to write a book and I was like oh no. I don't even know where to start doing that thing <laughs> writing notes all over your wall the, the my walls are for you guys to sign <laughs> I think too as a, as a self-help book or a professional book like that that's not a story book you don't realize that the knowledge you have not everyone else has it because mm. you just presume everyone else knows what you're talking about yeah so, so you don't think of yourself as an authority or an expert at the time. You mm -hmm. just think, well, everyone knows that, don't they? When you were growing up, did you ever consider that you would do anything like this? What did you want to be when you were little? Well, it, it sort of changed all the time. I remember as a really young child, I wanted to be a teacher. So I'm virtually teaching now. I educate yeah. people. But my mum always said I could rule the world. So I haven't got that far yet. But yeah. On your way, mate. I'm, I'm still bossy. <laughs> So you don't think I'm going to be an author, and I didn't think that even. I wouldn't have thought it would be possible because I left school at fifteen. Oh, okay. Okay, so there, never in my wildest dreams would I have considered I would have a profession or write a book. But in my family, there are authors. Great grandfather was a um, Henry Ernest Boot, and he wrote a lot of professional work and was um, a great artist and things like that. So it's in the bloodline. But yeah, you don't think you're going to do it. Mm, well, good on you, Marnie. That's awesome. So you've written a book, you've done your audio book, you, well, you've written another book with the duck story. You've got Kanique, you do kinesiology, you do angel readings, you know all about herbs and oils. Where do you want to go? What's your future? What's next? What's next? I just keep doing what I'm doing. Really? Well, the other book that's in the, in the pipeline that I haven't quite finished yet is a um, table, a picture book. And it's about um, conversations or my mum when she was 90 we had a big party for her and she got very depressed that day and i said Aww. what's what's wrong she said oh you can't help but know at 90 that you're at the end of your life Aww. not at the beginning and she was still having a lot of fun so i said oh okay so what can we do to look forward to doing it so i said well let's go and have cups of coffee because we love doing that yeah and we'll have cream cake with it and we'll take photos of it and she, at 80 she was um 90 then but at about 86 she joined facebook She's very careful. That she had, is so I know. Cool. <laughs> she loves it's to shock never people. Too late. <laughs> I know. She had 18 friends. She didn't like to have too many more than that. And she'd constantly say to me, Marnie, you found another friend last night. That's really, I don't think you should be doing that. But um, what we did was we'd go out and we'd have a cup of coffee with cake and cream cake and whatever we needed and take a photo, put it on my Facebook and tag her. And we ended up with a following. So we made the commitment of having 91 cups of coffee and cream cake yeah, with right. what we called coffee chats. Excellent. Right. And we got to 107 in wow. that year. In that year. <laughs> that's a lot of coffee. You didn't, you didn't realize, like when I first said it, it was just, well, you're going to be 91. Let's make 91 cups of coffee and cream cake. <laughs> Not thinking 52 weeks in a year. So yeah. you didn't go into that. You just went, let's go and do it. Yeah. And we got to 107, but we developed a following. So people would contact us and say, oh, can we join in coffee chats? And we'd, I remember one time we were out having coffee and this lady said, oh, there's Marnie and a mum. Let's oh. go and get a photo. And it was really That's good. Right. You and need it, to get that book out. It, it is. And it's it's just getting the bits in the middle. The, all the pictures are there and the beginnings there and the ends there because mum passed away. Yeah. Um, but it's just those little extras in the middle that you tend to think, oh, yeah, I'll do that. No, I won't. I'll do something else. So it's just a matter of sitting down and actually doing it. Yeah. And I know when the time is right, it will be finished. Yeah. And I keep saying it'll be this year, it'll be next year, yeah. it'll be some year, but it will be there. And 
what it made me realize was that it's the connection to people mm. that makes the difference. Yeah. And we did have a lot of people contact us afterwards and say, you made me realize that time won't wait. So you have to do it now. Um, we had some beautiful um, followings and feedback from people where it made them understand or, or do the similar kind of thing. Oh, that's wonderful. And, and that's where, you know, social media is marvellous for that. Yeah, definitely. Well, that kind of is like your mum's legacy, isn't it? Absolutely, yeah. Oh, that's yeah. beautiful. And so how long has your mum been gone for? Three years now, yeah. So I guess it's, it would be hard, a very emotional. Well, it is, but it was... Um, I mean, she's she's connected all the time. She was part of all of my life. Yeah. So my professional life, my home life, my business life. Because she would come to all my talks. She, she was didn't your number and, one fan? She was. She was my number one groupie. And she'd <laughs> sit in the audience and remind me of all the things I hadn't said. <laughs> as mums do. <laughs> Absolutely. But she loved it as well. She loved living, watching what was going on and being involved and, mm. and um, being a part of life. She would life. have been so proud of you. She was very proud, yeah. 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 Well, so the, back, back to Kanik, um, if people listening today want to come and see you, obviously they can do it globally now. They don't need Absolutely. to just come in Brisbane. Yeah, they yeah. can come from wherever because you're doing it online. What outcome can people expect when they come and empty their stress bucket with you? Cope, they cope better with life. Life's easier. And my book's called Creating Calm Amid Chaos. So they live in chaos. They don't think they are, but really in reality they often are. So how can you isolate something of that and, and honour yourself? You know, busy mums, um, business women, business men for that matter, they're not just that, they're everything. Yeah. So they're a person first. So they need to honour themselves first. And if they can keep themselves a little bit calmer, it means that they have a better opportunity to respond to life. You know, stress is insidious. It just builds and builds and builds. And eventually you have, um, it's in my book, you have a health deficit. And you don't realise it's building. No. Because you th you're just coping. You're, you're going one foot after the other and, and, and doing things. And all of a sudden something breaks down and you go, oh, okay, that's a bit funny. And then one thing breaks and you fix it and another one breaks. So it's a better matter of saying, okay, what's going on in my life? How well am I coping with, with um, things that happen out of the blue? Yeah. It's like Murphy's Law. You know, you're juggling one ball and Murphy will go, oh, how would you like There's a few more? Sticks. So they throw you a few. <laughs> yeah. So you're juggling many things at once. So someone who's experiencing a lot of stress in their life is not experiencing it from one side. They're feeling experiencing on many levels of their lives. And some things you can do things about, other things you can't. So it's a matter of how can you do, if, and if you don't, like to me, it's all about identifying what's stressing me as well. So if I know that something is stressing me, I can do something about it. If I don't know what it is or all the ingredients, how can I make any difference? Can you help um, listeners pinpoint what that is? Yeah. So yeah, yeah. you are the stress management queen. <laughs> so you say, that's good. <laughs> I'll, have, I'll have to get a halo, mate. Yeah, yes, you will. <laughs> so is there anything else that you'd like our listeners to hear that, you know, if they want to contact you and The only thing is I also like to mentor um, newer kinesiologists or practitioners oh. or even business owners so if, if someone is just starting off and and it doesn't mean i know all the answers but I, i'm i've probably hit a couple of the bricks yeah. <laughs> so once you've hit them once you kind of get a learning out of that um so if you know if there's newer practitioners or, or people in business want to ask questions or just ring up and say hi Oh, feel free. You're a lovely girl. What I do. You're very matter of fact. Ma matter of fact. Grounded. Yeah, yeah. So you've <laughs> that's the libra in me, see? <laughs> libra is very grounded. Yeah, well, yeah. that's very cool. So you've got the best of both worlds there with the medicine that you do through kinesiology and also yeah. just your temperament, yeah. you know. So, the, yeah, the no mess girl as well. Well, I think I believe. <laughs> Cleaning up all the mess, no mess oh, girl. Oh, <laughs> yeah. I'm a ghost buster. I'm a stress buster, see? Yeah, Who are you going to call? It. Marnie. Um, what? I was going to say something, and that was quite pivotal. That's gone. Oh. <laughs> it's all right. Okay. Um, so where can people contact you and how can people contact okay, you? Okay, so I have a website. It's called Kinique, K-I-N-I-Q-U-E dot com. And I'm on Facebook, Kinique Kinesiology. Um, personally as well, I'm on LinkedIn for professional businesses. So stress doesn't happen just to an individual. So stress happens in work situations as well. So I'm all very keen to... Um, to help people in their work field identify the stresses of their workers. So and how you, can you do that? You want to do that also maybe on a business level too. Absolutely. Actually, having dramas I muscle test staff. businesses for people. So. Right. I know, yeah, yeah. So what about your business is causing, um, is got a blockage in it. So, you know, how? Oh. why is the business blocked? Because the, the business has an energy as well. Wow. So, yeah. 
that we could we could chat about this all day. We could, like yeah. there's a lot that yeah. I haven't even seen. Yeah. And one of my um, gifts or skills is creating those mists that I make, so the emotional healing mists. Yeah. And I now offer that to other businesses as well. So I create mists for a business owner so that the owner then can on sell that or use that as one of their tools in their toolbox of their business. Now, right. it's not not always a natural therapy business. Sometimes it can be hairdressing salon. It could be you yeah. with um, people that come in and have speakers blocks. So I have um, ultimate speakers missed oh. um, so that people can release some of the blockages that are holding them back from. Oh, I might have to get a bottle of that. You might, yeah. <laughs> Spray it in the boot. Yeah, yeah. Great so, idea. And it's, it's an energetic, so it works on the uh, vibrational energy of what's going on but also with essential oils in it, it um, connects to your, being technical here, your olfactory senses, which is your sense of smell. So when you've got a, a positive smell or a positive sense of smell, um, you smell it again and you feel that same level of success. Oh, okay. Trigger. Which is why you've got the oils going yeah. in, the, in the room today. Do they feel good? They're great. Were they a good pick? They were lovely, yes. I said I nice colours too, my colours there, you know, yeah. blues there. <laughs> So Grounding got... for, for green. Well, the light green, the lime green is all about wealth and abundance. Yes. The pink is um, self-love. Right. And the blue is the healing hands. Hey, so there you go. Like, How's perfect? <laughs> <laughs> I Wonderful. think you were sending some energy for me to put those out today. <laughs> good, good choice. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. This has been really enlightening. I love talking to you, love working with you. And um, I think people are going to be very happy if they come see you and probably walk away with results that they've oh, they never will. got yes. before. Yeah. So. yeah. So just give Marnie a call or Thank check you. a website yeah, out. Yeah, check my website out. Email me. It's fine. Yeah. And that's info at Kinique. And Kinique itself has got its own energy. That's my seahorse. When I got investigated what it meant metaphysically, the seahorse wraps its tail around a piece of flotsam in the most turbulent of waters and stays stable. Wow. So it's, it sort of bends and flows, but it's anchored. Right. So, yeah. Did you find that out after you'd chosen that? I had, this, I had the image. So the little image is actually a fractal which is a mathematical equation. Yeah, okay. So my brother created that for me. Wow. But we always saw the seahorse and a gifted um, graphic designer cut the seahorse out in its shape. And I did investigate why I liked the energy of the seahorse. And it was a gentleman down the Gold Coast called um, Scott Alexander King who does the animal communications. And he was the one that told me the story of the seahorse. Because mm. that's, that's part of me too is everything I use, I like the story. So what's mm. the story about? How does that connect with the client? And it does. I remember you telling me the story about car parking, I think. Or the angel. Yeah, the angel. Yeah, that yeah, was lovely. Yeah. So you're very spiritual. Yeah. And also the traffic lights that you used to have. Oh, yes, non-green. <laughs> No, you just get green all yeah, the Yeah, I do. Whether they're non-green or green makes no difference. <laughs> That's yeah. awesome. Well, thanks for today. I really appreciate thanks, it. Marnie. Look forward to working again with you, Marnie. Lovely. Awesome. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thanks for joining me. Thank you. And my guests from around the world. Thank you for being a part of the show. The Simone Filer Podcast. Catch you next time. It's a wrap. <laughs>